All right, so we saw the spatial domain uh, expression for the Wiener filter, right? Which was uh, so the Wiener filter. If you come back to the Wiener filter, then uh, what we had was h hat is equal to well h hat. This is a filter. It this turns out to be R F H transpose, and I also showed another form for it. If you use the a B C D inversion lemma, right? Wherein you can show that R F enters enters S instead of R N. R F inverse will enter and then right? that in turn, in turn renders stability to the to the solution. Now this the spatial domain thing is not really that very you know insightful except for the prior and things that we can that we can see. What is more interesting is if you try to look at the 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 frequency domain interpretation okay of the Weiner filter, the frequency domain interpretation of Weiner filter. Domain interpretation of Weiner filter. Okay, then okay, that will actually give us a chance to get okay, a look at uh, look at its relation with the inverse filter that we saw in a sort of a deterministic sense earlier, and we'll be able to relate that, and then we'll also be able to see how the Weiner filter is able to achieve both deblurring as well as denoising, because we saw that G has both blur and noise, therefore it has to strike some kind of a trade-off. Right between how much to deblur and how much to denoise, and in, and in an optimal way, of course, right. So all that, right, we can see if we go through the frequency domain interpretation of the Weiner filter. Uh, but then the frequency domain interpretation for for doing this, we let us assume we let to make some assumptions. The first assumption that we're going to make is H is space invariant. Okay, otherwise, otherwise, you know, this frequency interpretation becomes hard. Okay. And uh, it's okay to assume, you know, because most of the times blur the space invariant. Therefore, you know, it uh, you know, it does give you give you the give you the leeway to actually analyze things in the Fourier domain. Now, the the F process, right? In this case, you know, F our our image, right? We can we'll assume it to be white and stationary. Okay, so that uh, so that the R F so that R F, which is its covariance, is actually doubly block circulant. Okay, so this means R F is doubly block circulant. Okay, doubly block circulant. These are the kind of things that we have anyway seen, right? Before also, H. Therefore, H is doubly block circulant. Okay, so these two matrices, and always, right? And always remember that. Remember that uh, that that when we write the F hat to be equal to H hat times G, we have lexicographically ordered the image F. Uh, the the F hat right that we have estimated is lexicographically ordered. Similarly, the observed image is lexicographically ordered as a vector. Okay, so R F is doubly block circulant. Now, under these assumptions, right, we can now and then R N. Okay, so say, same applies to noise. Okay, same applies to noise, and therefore, right, same we can say about R N two. Now, under these conditions, right, we can uh, we can make an attempt to go to the Fourier domain. And as we know, right, in order to go, in order to kind of uh, right, go to the Fourier domain, then uh, it'll mean that we let to multiply by a Fourier matrix. Okay, so let us say that I've got f hat is equal to h hat into G. G is my observation. Therefore, I'll do f phi f hat in order to take me to the Fourier domain. Will mean that I've got phi h hat G. Of course, in this case, this has to be a 2D DFT. Okay. 2D DFT of of an appropriate size, right? Which in this case, if f hat is m by m, then this vector is m square by one. Therefore, your 2D DFT will also have to be m square by m square, right? So, so this is your 2D DFT matrix, which we are which you are pre multiplying, uh, no, pre multiplying f hat, right, by phi in order to go to the Fourier domain, and this will be this, and this takes you to the Fourier domain as f hat. Now here also we would like everything to 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 come in the Fourier domain, but let's first look at phi. Then h hat itself is what? Let's just copy from here. R f h transpose. Okay, we can remove this bracket. R f h transpose, and then we've got h r f h transpose. H r f h transpose plus r n, the whole inverse. Okay, this is your h hat times g. Okay, now. Now on the left we've gone into the Fourier domain already, but on the right, right, we're not we're not seeing anything like that. So let's play the usual trick. Let's do phi R F phi star phi. We know that phi star phi is identity, therefore right, that is not going to change anything if you if you put phi star phi between I mean between R F and you see H transpose. Okay, so so we can put this as H transpose and again 
Okay, now what we can also do is uh, we can again multiply here, right? What we can do is we can okay h transpose and then we can again write this as phi star phi, okay, because this is again identity followed by h r f h transpose plus r n the whole inverse. Let's again put a phi star phi g. Okay, now phi g will of course take you to the Fourier domain, right? So this will be g. Okay, so this takes you to the Fourier domain of g. Now, now we would like to club things, right? So phi r f phi star, right? We know we know we'll diagonalize r f because r f is doubly block circular and therefore it will be diagonalized by the two D D F T matrix. Then phi. So now we'll decouple this and then take phi onto h transpose phi. Okay, this will give you give you a complex uh, a conjugate of uh, of your DFT. If it was phi h phi, phi star, it would have been your DFT coefficient. But because it's h transpose, it will give you h star. Okay, that is the complex conjugate of your DFT coefficient. Then this whole thing, right, that you have here, this we can push the inverse inside and call this as phi h r f h transpose plus r n phi star the whole inverse. And here it's g. And you can see that this is still correct because this is like a b whole inverse, which is b inverse a inverse. Phi star inverse is phi, which is sitting here, and the inverse of this is uh, no this inverse into a inverse into phi inverse. This inverse is here. Phi inverse is phi star, and therefore this is all phi. Now this now this we can further simplify as you can push phi star from there. You get phi h r f h transpose phi star plus phi r n phi star, right? And this you can further simplify. It's okay, right? So this guy you can simplify as phi h phi again same trick phi star phi r f phi star phi h transpose phi star plus phi r n phi star. Right? Now now uh, now right we are able to go into the Fourier domain for all the terms. Okay, so now let's let's write this down. Okay, so what this means is individually if I take up the k lth coefficient, right, remember that. Phi h phi star is a diagonal matrix. Phi r f phi star is diagonal. Phi h transpose phi star is diagonal. Phi r n phi star is diagonal because every one of these matrices is actually doubly block cyclic. Therefore, the inverse is also diagonal, right? Because you it's just one by one by it's simply the reciprocal of all the diagonal entries. Therefore, it makes it easy. Now, the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function gives you, gives you gives you the path spectral density, PSD of f, right? Let's indicate. SF, right? Suppose we indicate it as SFF, so that will be the path spectral density of F. Now, now, now this will be this will be H star of KL, right? Which will be the which will be the DFT coefficient of the the impulse response, the complex conjugate of the DFT coefficient of the of the blur, which in this case is space invariant. This will be the you know will be the DFT coefficient of the of the point spread function itself. This will be SF. This will be DF. Uh, this will be the this will be the Conjugate uh, the complex conjugate of the DFT quotient of the the spread function, the point spread function. This will be the this will be the PSD of noise. Let's indicate this as S N N. Therefore, at for every k comma l, right? So because all these guys are diagonal, so it's easy to easy to write them down instead of a matrix form. We can write this down as for a Fourier quotient k comma l. We can write this as see at the top. We've got like S F. This is SFF of k comma l, or let's write this is SF of k comma l. This is h star of k comma into h star of k comma l. The whole divided by right because it's a diagonal and you're taking the inverse, so the whole thing divided by this phi h phi h phi star will be h star of k l into this is SF of k l. Into this is h star of k l. No, this is h. Okay, this is not h star. Okay, because the first term is just phi h phi star. This is phi h transpose phi star is h star of k l, and then plus s n of k comma l, the whole into g of k comma l, which is the which is the DFT of the blurred image, blurred and noisy image. Or this can be in turn written as s f. K comma L into H star K comma L upon magnitude H K L square because of the fact that you got H into H star S F K L 
प्लस एस एन के एल और इन टू जी के एल ऑफकोर्स और दिस कैन बी डिवाइड बाई एस एफ के एल अस्यूम दैट के एल इज एस एफ इज नॉट जीरो एनी वे बाई मैग्निट्यूड एच के एल स्क्वेर के दिस इज मोस्ट स्टैंडर्ड फॉर्म प्लस एस एन ऑफ के एल बाई एस एफ ऑफ के एल ओके दिस इज दिस इज योर दिस इज योर वाइन ऑफ फिल्टर इन दोर योर डोमेन ओके एंड okay now this into of course gkl we should not forget that we have to multiply it with the observation right in order to see the see the de blurred image so this f hat is your de blurred and denoised image now now uh, now this filter right you can have interpretations for this filter okay which can throw some light on what is going on okay the interpretation right uh you know follows like this now interpretation okay because that's what we want to do now suppose right examine special case okay special cases uh, if n equal to 0 okay that means that means noiseless okay if there is if there is no noise okay therefore which means that right sn equal to 0 that means your sn is 0 and therefore what will happen is in this expression right you'll get h star by magnitude hkl square which is simply 1 by hkl right so therefore the wiener filter h hat of kl right becomes 1 by hkl which is simply the inverse filter okay which is the inverse filter and as you can see right because 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 it sees that that you have no noise therefore that right, it is willing to do for example right in this case you've got just blur and there is no noise and this value we know is 1 right for the forward the kind of blurring operator therefore it says that i'll go ahead and kind of de blur just as an inverse filter right would do that is the way it will work if you have a special case of Right, n equal to zero. The yeah, next case is if, uh, if let's say, if there is no blur. Okay, if there is no blur, there's no blur, or in other words, or in other words, we have H K L is equal to one for all K L is equal to one for all K L. Okay, that means you have only noise. Okay, in this case, which actually means that means that you have a blur which is simply a constant. Okay, but then you don't have any kind of noise. And uh, and for this situation, if you examine what kind of h hat you get, the the Fourier domain interpretation, you'll get uh, now in the earlier equation substituted h star, h star is one, right? H everything is one. Therefore, you'll get one by one plus s n k l by by s f k l. Okay, and this s f uh, s n by s f, right? In a loose sense, this you can look upon this as one by signal to noise ratio. Because signal to noise ratio is itself by itself, therefore, in a loose sense, right, uh, this is like one by signal to noise ratio, and therefore, we can further write this as uh, for the case when there is, uh, you know, when there is when there is no blur, right, and there is only noise, okay, no blur, and there is only noise, okay, so you get uh, S N R. So because it's one by one plus S N R, one one by one plus one by S N R, so it's S N R by S N R plus one. Okay, so what you have is S N R, S N R by S N R plus one. Now, if you if you see this, right, what it means is that at lower frequencies, if you see at lower frequencies, you see S N R, S N R is uh, you know is likely to be high, okay, and uh, because of the so because of this, it will be overwhelmingly larger than one, and therefore, right, uh, okay, these two will cancel off, and then you'll get a gain of roughly one, and then at higher frequencies, right, uh, as at at higher frequencies. Okay, S N R is likely to be very low, and therefore your your gain will be roughly equal to S N R itself, which means that you know it will start to fall. Okay, therefore, uh, therefore, right? If you look at so in this case the inverse filter, the Wiener filter behaved like an inverse filter in the first case, right? When you had noiseless situation, and in the case when you have only noise and there is no blur, right? It will it will try to act like a low pass filter. Okay, so this is like a smoother. That means you know it's going to just smooth out noise. And uh, because at higher frequencies it wants to put lower, you know, lesser and lesser emphasis on noise, and therefore, right, it will try to gain, give a gain that is much less than one for noisy, for noisy values of, of uh, for, for, for in order to handle noise, right? Therefore, at higher frequencies the gain will go down. Okay, therefore, if you look at it, right, this guy acts like a smoother. Okay, when there is, okay, when there is, uh, when there is only blur. Okay, and uh, in this case it acted like an inverse filter in the other case. Now. what you typically will have is is the is the normal case is when you have both blur okay both blur and noise okay 
And when you have both blur and noise, what the Wiener filter does is it it kind of strikes a beautiful trade-off okay, between the between being the inverse filter and then being the smoothing filter, right? Because because those are the two extremes. Therefore, if you think about it, right, when you have blur, okay, this is your this is your blur, okay, this is your HKL, okay. And what the what the Weiner filter will really do is, if you see the expression of the Weiner filter, when you have both blur and noise, what it will attempt to do is the following, right? Initially, okay, okay, right? This gain is one, okay, the gain at zero. So here is your k comma l. This is your frequency, and this is your h hat of k comma l. Okay, this is your, this is your Fourier. Uh, this is the this is the frequency response of your Weiner filter. Now at lower frequencies, right, it will behave more like an inverse filter because 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 it knows that at lower frequencies it can afford to actually invert. Uh, invert the blur. Therefore, it goes like that. Okay, at lower oh, at lower frequencies, it goes like that, right? It it, no, it behaves like an inverse filter at lower frequencies because that's how it is supposed to behave. Okay, and at higher frequencies, right? It kind of begins to act like a smoother because it knows that beyond a point, behaving like an inverse filter, right? It doesn't make sense because then it'll amplify noise. Therefore, beyond a point, right? It'll start to reduce the gain. And similarly, right, beyond a point, it'll start to reduce the gain. So it has some kind of a hump here. Right, and in this region, it behaves like an inverse filter, and after some point, it behaves like a smoother. And and after what point it should take over from being an inverse filter to a smoother? Right, you know, it depends upon the equation itself. Right, it is automatically done. We don't have to choose this. It will automatically do it depending upon the values of your of the pass spectral density of noise, pass spectral density of the signal, and uh, and right, how much of blur you have. Okay, in the in the image. So, so in that sense, it will it will kind of choose this value optimally, right? So this uh, transition will happen in an optimal way because the whole Wiener filter itself is an optimal filter, and therefore, right? Uh, and therefore, this is how it achieves deblurring as well as denoising. Now, the 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 one sort of a question that remains is how do you find, right? I mean, so how do I find SF? Okay, noise. You can imagine that you can go to go to an image and then find a homogeneous region. That means find a roughly very smooth region and then compute the variance of the image in that region in the observation, and that will give you a sense for sense for noise. Okay, uh, because in all of this we are assuming that right we would know the blur. How do you find how do you find SF? Okay, okay, could be a question. Now how do you find SF? Uh, but of course you know in this case we can even assume that if it is non-blind deep learning, the you know if it is non-blind then we'll assume that because okay which is what we are assuming till now so we'll assume that the point spread function is known. We may even assume that the that the spectral density of the noise is known. But what is not clear is how do you get SF because you have only a single image and where is the autocorrelation function and so on. So therefore right there are the, I don't know so the, the 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 common way to do it is. To simply assume, right? One of the ways to kind of do it is to simply assume this to be a constant k and find out for what value of k, right? Is your is your deep learning turning out to be the best visually? Okay, so so simply, right? There's a value k, and then you simply vary k, okay, all the way from right zero to upwards. Okay, so when it is zero, it's like a no, it's like a uh, no, it's like a chart of k is equal k is equal to one, and then and then right, you can take this ratio as as, as a constant, and then for that, right, you have you you do an inversion. And then, and then, kind of, you change your value of k, and for each value of k, you you compute the inverse filter, and then you compute the compute the deblurred image, and then try to see which one of them is most appealing. But then, more common, for example, MATLAB MATLAB allows an implementation like this. But what is more common and more sensible to do is to take a bunch of take hundreds of natural images, okay, around you, okay, from around you. In fact, that if you just go to a database. Okay, I know there are there are so many kind of see databases available the, available these days. Therefore, we could simply look for look for natural images. Okay, databases natural images. Take hundreds of natural images, compute the Fourier transform. Of course, you know change uh, you know whatever resize them to the size of the size of the image that you have on hand. Resize them and uh, and then what you do is so resize to the size of f. Okay, which is your or to the size of f or g, right? That you have with you, and then Compute uh, compute the Fourier transform. Compute the Fourier transform. Let's say Fourier transform. Let's say let's say that each of these images has a, has a Fourier transform x i. Okay, and and approximate S F. Approximate S F as one by m summation. If I write x i, if it's a matrix, right? S i x i is a matrix now. It's a it's a kind of a D F T. It contains the D F T coefficients of that natural image. So do x i star x i. Okay, this is a matrix element wise matrix multiplication where i goes from one to m. So so such an averaging of the 
of the of the of the of the of the magnitude square of the Fourier coefficients of natural images can be taken to be a rough estimate of SF, right? Because in the absence of any other knowledge, if you knew a little bit more about F, suppose let's say you know somebody told you that F is actually a face image, right? Then I can do a little better. Now instead of using natural images, what I would do is I will probably go look for faces, right? Look for face images and take many of them, okay? And uh, and then again, right? Do the same thing. Take hundreds of face images, compute the Fourier transform, right? Take the magnitude square. And then average it over all those images, and that can be taken as an estimate of SF. And if G is a blurred face image, then this SF will be will be actually much better than 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 taking arbitrary natural images, because again, right, this is some kind of a prior that you know. If you because if you look at an image, you will know whether it's a face or whether it is something else. Now, if now that prior can again be utilized in order to kind of uh, not to kind of bring in more stability to your solution. That's why I said, right, right at the beginning, that the prior can come in any form, right? You can bring it in, the algorithm can bring it in, whatever ways, right? That that you can actually bring that information in. That is going to that is going to that is going to lend its stability, numerical stability. And therefore, right, if instead of using arbitrary natural images, if you try to use only phase images, given that G is actually a blurred phase image, then in that case, if you try to compute SF using only phase images, then that estimate will give you a better deblurred image than the one that you would get with just arbitrary arbitrary natural images. Okay, with that, with that, we conclude the with the Weiner filter, and uh, and uh, and uh, right, you would uh, and just one last comment that uh, the Weiner filter, of course, has this Fourier, you know, Fourier kind of an interpretation on all that. But but as of today, if you try to see what kind of deblurring right algorithms are out there, which are which are kind of most sought after and which are most used, are the ones that are still in the spatial domain. Especially the kind of constrained least squares kind of a solution where I told you that you have an observation term and then right you have a prior. The prior is of the form of gamma times norm of QF, uh, QF norm of QF, and the norm itself could be L1, norm could be L2, Q could be a Laplacian Q, Q, right? Could be could be a, could be a first derivative along X, a first derivative along Y, some of some of those those gradients, the L1 norm. Okay, because those are the things. Because the Weiner filter is nice in the sense that you have a closed form expression. But then, uh, but then, right? Because you are assuming space invariance, you are assuming some knowledge of the spectral density and all of that. This could still, this will not still match up to the quality, right? That you would get through through uh, through through spatial optimization. Okay. Therefore, spatial optimization methods are still more general. They are, they are more see, accommodative, than, as I said, right? Right at the beginning, you know, they are more general. You know, they can they can they can deal with more general situations, and their priors can also be far more far more powerful than the implicit priors something like a Wiener filter has.